Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process, um, which is a joint project of the Pop Conference, IAS from US, and the Journal of Popular Music Studies. I'm Francesca Royster, and um, I'm excited on the behalf of my co-organizers, um, Carl Wilson, Eric Weisbart, Ken Mack, and Gus Stadler to welcome Mark Anthony Neal and his discussant Sasha and Panoram and I, Augustus Durham. And we're gonna be talking about Mark's new book, Black Ephemera, The Crisis and Challenge of the Musical Archive, which is gonna be super, super exciting. So um, you can find our whole cal calendar of events on the IASPM website under the Journal of Popular Music Studies tab. And you can also um, get on the mailing list by contacting Eric. Um, it's also, um, you can also catch up on all the videos of our past sessions, um, including um, like the really wonderful one with Charlie Kornberg last week um, on Eric's YouTube channel. I just taught um, Honey, Abdur Akib's um, video conversation in my writing about music class just last week. So our next session is going to be next week. We're going fast and furious all February um, with presentations every week. Um, next week will be a diva themed conversation with Lynn, Lynn Melnick and Deborah Paradis. And it's at the same time at five o'clock Eastern time. Um, and we're doing Mondays uh, for this year. But today, um, as I said, we're going to be hearing from Mark Anthony Neal, Sasha Ann Panoram, and I, Augustus Durham. So um, the topic of the talk is, what does it mean to think of Black ephemera, Black musical archives, as a fugitive archival matter, as marooned archives? Such a question um, is a discussion of what Mark Anthony Neal terms and Black ephemera as a crisis and a challenge of the Black musical archive. The crisis of the archive figured as a critique of the general state of the Black cultural criticism today, and the challenge figured in a theorizing of Black culture that remains grounded in the archive and its capacity to generate expansive and liberatory notions of Blackness not intended for mass consumption. So just to introduce you to our folks, Mark Anthony Neal um, is James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of African American Studies, Professor of English and Professor of Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies at Duke University. Um, Neal is the author of six books, included Black Ephemera, which was just published this um, last year. Um, what the Music Said, Black Popular Music and Popular Culture in 1999, Soul Babies, Black Popular Culture, The Post-Soul Aesthetic from 2002, and Looking for Leroy, Illegible Black Masculinities in 2013. He's also the co-editor with Murray Forum of That's the Joint, the Hip Hop Studies Reader, which is now in its second edition. Um, and there's so many other great things that Mark has done as a public, a public scholar as well, including um, appearing in PBS's Hip Hop, Beyond Beats and Rhymes, Netflix, The Two Killings of Sam Cooke, and Rights to Offend, and also um, hosting his weekly video podcast, Left of Black, which is now in its 13th season, which is produced in collaboration with the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke. There's so much more to say about uh, Mark but um, we want to hear hear from him in his book, so I will um, I'll keep it moving. Um, Sasha and Panaram is an assistant professor of English and an affiliated faculty member in African and African American Studies at Fordham University, where she specializes in African American and Caribbean literature and culture, with a particular interest in women's and gender studies and slavery studies. She received her PhD in English from Duke University in 2020 and has completed certificates in African and African American studies, feminist studies and college teaching. And um, you can find her published research in The Black Scholar, Small Acts and Southern Cultures, as well as public works in Black Perspectives, uh, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Public Books and Left of Black. 
and um, she was most recently the series editor for an online symposium for public books that celebrated what it would have been Octavia E. Butler's 75th birthday. And I, Augustus Durham, <clears throat> is an assistant professor of English at Lehman College, CUNY, where research, his research focuses on Black studies from the 19th through the 21st century, centuries. His first book, Stay Black and Die on Melancholy and Genius, will be published by, by Duke University Press in December of 2023. Um, and it interrogates how melancholy catalyzes performances of genius. Um, his work has been published in Black Camera, an international film journal, Palimpsest, a journal of women, gender, and the Black International, and journal of religion and health. And he recently contributed an essay on the film Moonlight to an edited collection on the work of Terrell Alvin McCraney. Um, prior to his appointment, uh, Durham was the president's doctoral fellow in English at the University of Maryland College Park. And so as, uh, as Kim just um, reminded us, um, everyone, please put your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll ask our panelists to uh, not worry about the chat until after we're all done, and we'll have a great conversation uh, curated by Kim. So uh, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you, Mark. So glad Thank you're here. You. What's up, Sasha and Israel? Hey. Hi. Good to be here. Excuse me if I call. <clears throat> that's why I have my water. Um, so let I, I, I guess I want to first say um, on behalf of Sasha and myself um, that we're really glad to be here to celebrate your book um, and certainly celebrate your book and community. Um, given what you meant to the two of us, it seems apropos to be here to um, celebrate with you. So first of all, saying thank you to, um, to the Popular Music in Progress uh, Working Group. <clears throat> but also um, to all of you for being here with us. Um, so yeah, at least I'll open up that. Um, we kind of decided that what we would do is we'd, we'd have you uh, maybe talk about how you arrive at the book and then certainly um, maybe read an excerpt from the book and then we would jump into our questions. Um, so yeah, you know, um, it seems like <clears throat> just reading the book that much of the book actually emerges from conversations that we had while we were at Duke, um, in particular conversations that we had over um, our various um, epic dinners. <laughs> um, so yeah, so can you tell us kind of how you arrive at the book and what kind of impetus brings about the book? And then certainly if there's a if there's a section of the book that you find uh, most intriguing to share with us, um, yeah. and then we'll jump into our questions. So I, I didn't think I was writing a music book. Um, I didn't. I didn't know when I was ever going to write another music book. That that seemed to be another part of my career, though I obviously hadn't, you know, incorporated music in, in some of the books since "What's the Music Said" and and "Songs in the Key of Black Life." Um, but I knew as early as about 15 years ago, when I was really introduced to Aretha Franklin's Columbia catalog that I wanted to find some way to write about the Aretha Franklin that we don't pay a lot of attention to. Um, at the same time, I have been mesmerized for about 30 years by these Marvin Gaye songs. Um, these charts that were in, you know, initially recorded by Gaye in 1967 um, with arrangements by the great Bobby Scott that Marvin Gaye worked on continuously from 1967 until his shooting death in 1984 um, th that were just so beautiful and lush and elaborate, especially when he brought that kind of uh, production technique to it and the layering of his different voices. You know, Gay always wanted to be the Black Sinatra, right? He wanted to record his version of In the Wee Small Hours of the Morning. So those were kind of two separate projects that I hadn't thought about in the same space. The project really started with this uh, digital humanities moment, wanting to write something about what was happening in the culture um, around social media and blackness. And, and, and I initially conceived it as early as 2013 as, as doing that sort of work. Um, and as I mentioned in the introduction to the book, you know, I, I spent a three year period um, working with Jessica Marie Johnson. Uh, I was her apprentice. <laughs> 
um, trying to figure out how to navigate this black digital humanities space. And, and I came out on the other side around 16 and 17, really realizing that my what my contribution was to this conversation was to think about this transition between the analog to the digital what gets gained, what gets lost. Um, and, and then to specifically think about this in the context of, of archives. Um, I had written a piece back in 2012 about Stax records um, and fascinating with the story of Stax and, and how the record label lost its most of its catalog, you know, because of a deal with Atlantic Records that had been its distributor. Um, and how Al, Be Al Bell um, took over this record label in 1968 with no music uh, and how he went about the process of rebuilding the catalog um, to the Stax records that we know now that in many ways is very different to the, of the Stax records of the Booker T and MGs and, and, and Otis Redding, right? This, this is the Stax of Isaac Hayes and David Porter and, you know, uh, someone like uh, the Staple Singers um, and folks like that. Rance Allen, you know, who I was thankful to have the opportunity, you know, to write about in the book. Um, and it kind of doubled down when I had the opportunity to spend some time, you know, over a two year period with Al Bell, you know, just to hear kind of his narrative about how, you know, how important this music was and what he did to kind of build out this new archive. And that's really where the book came. Um, I didn't know what it was for a long time which you know, obviously is not unusual for my books at least, um, but it was really you know, Saturday and Sunday mornings, uh, 5.30 in the morning at Starbucks in 18 and 19, you know, when we, we doubled down on this and, and we were you know, able to kind of finish it right before the pandemic. Thank you for that. And is there, again, is there a section of the book that you think kind of encapsulates? Yeah, I'm gonna read from the coda um, at the end of the book, uh, which is called Writing and Living with Black Ephemera. Uh, the opening passage of my first book, What the Music Said, begins with a remembrance of listening to Junior Walker and the All-Stars. What does it take to win your love while sitting with my dad in an uncle's car? I told the story then and I recall it now to make a collateral claim. As I write about the Black Musical Archive, I have lived with that musical archive. But in many ways, it's an empty boast. What Black American adult of a certain age has not grown up in a house or an apartment where the various traditions of Black music flowed like the wind through the open windows doing those requis requisite Saturday morning house cleanings? This was the case for even those families for whom the blues, R&B, and jazz, and especially soul, were seen as corruptions of Black church music, were always thought of as the devil's music, as my longtime teaching collaborator Patrick Douth at Nine Wonder often comically notes. Instead, I'll make another claim about two Black American parents, one born in Georgia, the other in North Carolina and raised in Baltimore, who unwittingly made their only child a student of that archive. My parents were not churchgoers and to my mind, not particularly religious, but our apartment during my childhood was filled with the music of Charlie Caesar, the Mighty Clouds of Joy, Inez Andrews, the Soul Stirrers, the Dixie Hummingbirds and Tessie Hill. I say this not to make a point about the kinds of music that my parents listened to, to be sure, Luther Ingram, Jimmy Smith, Al Green, Jimmy McGriff, Teddy Pendergrass, and Millie Jackson got their share of spins on the turntable. Rather, I want to note that there was something sacred, even devout, about their listening practices. The centrality of recorded music in their lives could be gleaned from my dad's Fisher amplifier, which he bought in 1972 when I was six and which survived long enough to see me graduate from college to the huge speakers that served as mantles in our living room and the smaller speakers, one placed above a kitchen cabinet and another placed above my parents' bedroom door. Our 700 square foot, two bedroom, third floor apartment overflowed with music and it was not unusual on a Saturday afternoon to hear it coming from our third floor apartment and entering our five story tenement. I had no choice but to imbibe the music. And yet in a six, And yet, in a six month period in 1971, at age five, I witnessed the Supremes at the Apollo, host Miss Ross, the Jackson Five at Madison Square Garden, and Aretha Franklin doing her legendary residency at the Apollo. 
I remember the Supremes concert in particular because they sang Stone Love, my favorite song at the time, and because I lost a ring that my mother had given me under the seats, which became an excuse not to buy me another piece of jewelry until I was an adult. I can only recall the Jackson 5 as tiny figures visible from the nosebleed seats my mother was able to afford, even though the group's third album released a year before was the first record I ever asked my mother to buy for me. For years though, the Aretha Franklin concert stayed with me, not so much for the performance but because of Franklin's band leader, King Curtis, a legend in his own right, was stabbed outside his New York apartment a few months later on my mother's birthday. I vividly recall my parents speaking in hushed tones about how they had just seen him with Aretha. A few years later, when not yet age 10, I started binging on Sam Cooke records after hearing his vocals on a KTEL television commercial and coming across my father's record collection, King Curtis's tribute to Cooke, recorded in 1965, a year after King Cooke's death. That album became the portal to my lifelong obsession with Cooke Indeed, one of my biggest professional laments is that my father didn't live long enough to see me talk about the singer in Kelly Dewan De La Vega's film, The Two Killings of Sam Cooke, because Cooke was his dude, much the way pubescent Michael Jackson was mine in childhood. Much of this book is about the culture, the ephemera that I've lived with for much of my life. I've come to understand that the practices of Black ephemera must be taught with the ability to help curate archives that are kinetic, if not living and breathing in their own right. And it is a learned skill. Some of that archive I took for granted. My mother blasting Isaac Hayes' Black Moses 8 track on a Saturday morning while my father was at work, watching the documentary King, a film record, Montgomery to Memphis, in high school and again in college, realizing that what stayed with me from the film was Nina Simone's haunting performance of Why the King of Love is Dead. Before I ever heard Aretha Franklin's Live at the Fillmore West or Amazing Grace, arguably the defining examples of her musical genius and cultural significance, I had my own frame of reference for her, having seen and heard her with my own five-year-old eyes and ears. Live at the Fillmore West, recorded in March of 71, was part of the same national tour that brought Franklin and Curtis to the Apollo Theater in 1971. Live at the Fillmore West meant that even as a child, I understood that all should come to a stop when Ray Charles shows up on that third night to join Miss Franklin on stage. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we'll go ahead and launch into my our question. Sasha, I can start if you want to start. It doesn't. Sure, maybe I'll start. You know, I love that you actually began with the coda because so much of the coda you know, mirrors and reflects what you wrote in the introduction as well. You know, the way that you situate this project um, by introducing us to your sonic world, which is really also introducing us to your parents. Mm -hmm. you know, your mother bought you your first boom box. You've said elsewhere with us that your father worked a lot, but some of the quality time that you spent together was Sunday mornings when the house was infused with music from his record. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck by the part of the book in the introduction where you talk about later when you show your father the iPod that you had and sort of the look <laughs> on his face, you know, when you realize, but then also, you know, a certain type of maybe challenge, as you put it, to remaining connected to the sonic world. And reading that made me want to ask you, you know, what is your relationship to music today? And how has that relationship changed with new technological advancements? You know, the way that music is made, the way it's released, the way we have access to acquire it. Um, how's your listening practice changed? Yeah, I think it's changed. I mean, there's certain ways that it's changed um, because so much of the technology is personal now. I'm more likely to listen to the music in a set of headphones. Um, these days, my, my Bose 700s are, are the go-to. Um, when I was growing up, that wasn't necessarily an, an option, right? So it really was about listening to music in a way that filled the house. Um, it was something that I was not a easily able to reproduce when I got married and had my own family. Right. We, we literally don't have a record player right in the house. We don't have speakers. Everyone listens, you know, to music on their laptop or the computer or something along those lines. So in that way, you know, my listening, you know, takes place in, in a very, very kind of personal space. One of the things that writing this book showed to me, I, because I've written at length 
throughout my career about my relationship to my father in music, um, particularly introducing me to gospel singers. I, I listen to Sam Cooke now, talk about Sam Cooke as he was my father's favorite singer. Um, the respect um, that my father had for the mighty clouds of joy. You know, they, they did a live album in 1966 that like remains one of my favorite albums ever. I still have it on vinyl, in fact. But one of the things the book showed to me because my father worked so much and I spent a lot of time with my mother as a kid was how much her listening practices impacted upon um, my own listening practices. I really hadn't considered that before until I wrote this book. Um, to be sure, I listened to Aretha Franklin and Shirley Caesar for that reason. But she was also my portal into quote unquote soul men. Um, like a Teddy Pendergrass, Al Green, and Luther Ingram. Um, so in that way, the project very much brought me back to my mother and, and my father also, who were both now deceased. You know, as I write in the book, there were lots of times when I was trying to finish the book, and I write a little bit about Reverend James Cleveland, you know, in his section on stacks, um, and listening to, um, you know, James Cleveland saying, I stood on the banks of Jordan, um, and there wasn't a time when I, that came in, into my ear while I was working on the book, usually again at Starbucks, where I really just had to stop and put everything down. Because um, it was like, it was the way that I could commune with them on a regular basis. And, and I still feel that kind of connection to music. I, you know, I, I joke in the book that I probably listened to Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace um, the full two days, you know, uh, in sequence about seven or eight times a year, right? And, and really it's a time for me to, to be able to commune with my mother. Um, when I was a young father, it was very important for me to create a musical platform for my daughters, right? So that, you know, the same way my parents unwittingly introduced this to me, I, I was more um, intentional about it. And so that when my youngest daughter um, calls me up a couple of days ago, beginning of Black History Month, um, and she goes, you know what I'm listening to all this month? <laughs> and she goes, and she just starts singing Queen Latifah's You and I, T-I-Y. Um, in my mind, it's like that was exactly, you know, that connection between my parents to me, to my children. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> in some ways, that's a, that's a really good segue to the question that I have, um, in part because in some ways, and I, you know, we have had this kind of discussion before, you know, in some ways I can see them my own life mirrored in yours and so far as like how my parents really influence um, mm -hmm. my understanding of an archive. You know, so my mother is classically trained pianist, uh, majors in piano, you know, so in some ways the classical music and whatever year I have for it comes from her, but then my father really only played Motown when we were kids. So, you know, I have very, very, vivid, very vivid memories of watching Motown 25 on VHS, which I think we still have at home, okay. So there's something going on around like, you know, the parent in the archive. But to me, it also brings to mind um, how one locates oneself in the archive, um, which is to say, you know, again, thinking about the ways we intersect, you know, so certainly in my own book, I'm thinking a lot about Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know for sure that one of the reasons why I'm thinking about him is because insofar as I have an understanding of his archive, I had to find myself in it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like write about it. Um, so one of the questions I have, especially as you're thinking a lot about the archive is, how do you find yourself in it or how might you understand the archive as a measure of making of a making of the self? <laughs> That's a great question, um, Israel. You know, I, I didn't always think that I was doing work that we would think of as as archival work, right? I, I you know, as someone who worked in cultural studies, for which the archive was literally something that was ephemeral, right? You know, there were no stacks necessarily that I went to. I never thought in those kinds of terms about archives. Um, but again, mentioning you know my mother's listening habits and and particularly Isaac Hayes. Second movement, hot buttered soul, um, to be continued, um, and then Black Moses. Um, you know, those were like cornerstones of, of my listening practices as a kid. And of course, it wasn't until much later that I realized how much revisionist work that Isaac Hayes was doing, right? It, it was actually only after 
hearing early Luther Vandross and Luther Vandross' first practices. And I'm and folks are saying, wow, that's phenomenal what he's doing. And then I'm like, well, no. <laughs> you know, Isaac Hayes took on the carpenters. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, I posted on Twitter this past weekend that that version of they long to be close to you, you know, with that with that two minute intro, um, which is a master class in string arrangements, brass arrangements and and um, uh, vocal arrangements. Right. And, and the drum break in the middle. Right. Which was like, you know, just something you wanted to get to in terms of sampling for a hip hop drum beat. Um, it was going back to that music that I found some version of myself that was understanding how complex this music was. And even if I didn't think at 17 or 18, right? I mean, I'm 19 years old with Isaac Hayes mixtapes going to school, right? All my peers are listening to Atlantic Star, Midnight Star, Cheryl Lynn, you know, classic, you know, machine based <laughs> um, 1980s R&B, which I loved. Right, but at the same time, I'm listening to these deep, you know, mixes of Isaac Hayes music, you know, from 15 years earlier. Um, what I located in terms of the archive with myself was someone who had old ears, um, someone who her always heard the world beyond the moment that I was in. Um, the fact that I'm a 10 years a 10 years old, I'm tracking down Sam Cook records, <laughs> you know, as one example. Right, I, I remember going to my godmother's house and going through her 45s and finding a 45 of last mile of the way, <laughs> right? And I was like, can I have this? And she's looking at me like I'm crazy because like, you know, shouldn't you be listening to the Jackson 5? But I also understood that that was part of it also, right? You know, the Jackson 5 version of Bridge Over Troubled Water was the first version of that song I heard. In fact, I had heard that version from them and Aretha before I ever heard, you know, the Simon and Garfunkel version of it, you know. So it was, it was just those kinds of things. So I, I found, I find in the archive, a young Mark Anthony Neal processing the world as an only child, um, you know, with uneducated parents, but who are giving him the gift of this music. And then being able to go forward, you know, both Sasha and, and Israel, you know, you both were TAs you know, in the hip hop class that I co-taught um, with Knife Wonder. Um, and, you know, that course started out in its earliest iteration, iteration as a class called Sampling Soul. Um, and, and it was midway through teaching that class and we taught it together for a decade when I realized, well, you know, hip hop is an archival project and it's the way I've always been interested in hip hop, right? I, I was never much for the lyrical content. I mean, that was important. You know, I, Big Daddy King, Rakim, Jay-Z, yeah, but all of that. But what always brought me to hip hop was the sonic quality of it, right? You know, Knife One and I became co-teachers and friends, in fact, when we bonded over that Tom Scott sample and Pete Rock and CL Smooths, they reminisce over you, right? Which, you know, unfortunately, it's something I wanted to write about in the book, but I didn't get a chance to. Thank you for that. I mean, yeah, I think too, um... Yeah, the old ears part to me is interesting, especially, again, conversations we've had um, where we think about artists as archival singers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What does it mean to think about, you know, say someone like Erica Badu, who we know is listening to a whole bunch of other stuff in order to make a sound that is her own and yet is actually not her own at all? Right. You know, I, I, I always hate to bring up these days, you know, M Mr. Kelly. Um, but you know, my entry point for really being interested in in Robert's music was never the bump and grind stuff, right? It was the way that he was able to mimic folks in the archive, right? So hearing, you know, Jeffrey Osborne, hearing Lenny Williams, right? Obviously, hearing folks like Donny Hathaway and Sam Cooke, um, it felt as though he was channeling right to a younger audience, right, a 1990s R&B hip hop audience. He, these voices from elsewhere, right, and and you know from the backstory that we know about how Robert grew up, this was stuff that his mother intentionally, you know, doubled down on him, right. Even you know he did an interview one time where he talked about his mother forced him to learn um, the Stevie Wonder runs on Master Blaster Janet. <laughs> Right, and, and however we might feel about, you know, Robert these days, right, that's part of what he was doing. He was doing archival work in the way that he sang. Um, and there are lots of other, you mentioned Erica Badu being a great example of that also. 
Um, you know, even someone like Music Soul Child, right? Particularly his production techniques, right? Echo this earlier era of music. It's so interesting hearing you talk about the archive that, this way because you really are reconfiguring how we think of the archive. I think oftentimes people think stacks of boxes, waiting through a lot of materials. Um, you know, you're you're pushing us to think about those to use the word things that are ephemeral, things are on the edge. But it's also interesting because music has a certain ephemerality to it as well. Like there's an immaterial, it's something fleeting about that. And I think, you know, that that's why I so appreciate the title of your book itself, insofar as pushing us both to reconfigure archive, but also ephemera at the same time in its relation to music. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, <laughs> I think we spend a lot more time because of streaming services and things like that. Um, music seems like something that we can capture and contain. Mm -hmm. Right, that, that, that wasn't always the case, right? You know, my experience as a kid growing up listening to New York City radio, and for me that meant listening to WBLS, but also listening to WABC. Um, at another point in time, listening to 99X when 99X was, you know, kind of a, a rock station. And then it segues into this thing that we now know as KISS FM, you know, which becomes this kind of launching pad for R&B and hip hop in New York. And my experience with that was always hearing music that I didn't know what it was, didn't know the title, didn't know how, who the artist was and waiting to when I could hear that music again, right? Cause it was like, it was lost. Um, you know, this is song uh, by Motherload um, and When I Die. Um, and I had heard it one time in 1983, I heard it again, like in 1991, still didn't know who the hell it was, and was sitting in a car in Chicago with the late Richard Eiden. We had just gone to Dusty Grooves. Um, and the song came on, and he was like, well, yeah, because they were big. He grew up in Canada. They were big in Canada, right? And, and it's like, I had no idea who these folks were. <laughs> And so music for me had always been this kind of chase down, right? We're in a moment where we don't have to do that now, right? We can just Google, right? We can literally just go to this huge digital archive and try to track these things down. And for me, you know, there's the archive of the things that we can't capture. And then there's the archive of things that are so readily accessible to us. And, and I really wanted to talk through this idea of what are the kinds of black musical expression that resist hyper commodification, right? You know, when I was a, a working music journalist, which means an academic who was writing for Pop Matters, you know, back in the day, um, I always wanted to do reviews of that music that I knew wasn't going to blow up, right? So that it always remained something really personal and intimate to me and artists who would remain personal and intimate to other kinds of folks. Um, and, you know, I feel as though when I look at the operation of writing about music now as a journalist or otherwise, um, you know, folks don't so much have an interest in that kind of music journalism anymore. It, it really is about entertainment, um, very little knowledge of the industry. And, and part of the reason why I titled the book the way I did, The Crisis and the Challenge of the Archive, you know, part of the crisis of the archive is that there aren't people around who can write about the archive well, because they don't know the archive. Right, they, they don't know the connective tissue um, that brings so many of these artists forward, right? And this is even in the midst of saying contemporary hip hop and R&D where, where the sampling process, you know, practice in some cases are so blatant, <laughs> right? And, and folks will know the sample of another song that sampled the original song, but they won't know the original song that was sampled in the first place. It's Mary J. Blige singing Sweet Thing and people not knowing. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, you know, I think too, um, you know, the response you just gave maybe actually opens up um, another question that I had, and it kind of emerges from your referencing of Clyde Woods mm. in the book. Um, so, you know, again, thinking about the ways in which, you know, so, so much of our work overlaps, you know, in my own work, I'm very much interested in what the blues epistemology is doing 
as the kind of heuristic for understanding, you know, like African American, you know, black culture. Um, but at the same time, I think for me in reading your book, I wanted to ask you, do you think that it is possible that the archive is blue? <laughs> but unpack that some more for me, Israel. Um, I, you know, in reading the book, you know, again, just, you know, for the sake of my own interest, you know, in reading the book, it just seems like what you're chronicling is not just a crisis and a challenge, but basically it's as if you're chronicling uh, the archive as a site of mourning, <laughs> as a site of melancholy. You know, so <laughs> you're reading. Um, I knew that part was coming. But you coming. Know, I'm reading it, I'm kind of thinking like, wow, you know, um, so whether you're thinking about Zuzu, whether you're thinking about um, Jackie Wilson, uh, whether you think about Patti LaBelle and Jackie, Will you know, it's as if you're really trying to chronicle a mode of just um, of loss and people trying to recover those losses, um, people trying to innovate those losses. Um, so it just felt like to me, um, you're kind of reading the archive as a space of a kind of blueness, which I think, again, I think Clyde Woods is getting at too about, you know, like, um, you know, when he talks about blocks, right? Um, or when he just talks about the sheer, you know, notion of like trying to make something out of nothing. Um, so yeah, you know, I it, to me, it just seems like, you know, you're really kind of thinking a lot about uh, the archive as a, the, the archive as a space of a kind of blueness or a kind of loss that's constantly being, uh, attempting to be recovered um, at the same time that almost um, like that the, mm, that maybe the challenge of it is precisely that it's the thing that can't be captured and yet it's something that we're constantly trying to like capture or something that we're trying to recover that can't. So, you know, people are just gesturing as best they can. So, you know, uh, Aretha Franklin makes her own songbook, American songbook, because it's something that she can't capture, but it's something that she has to create and create anew. So yeah, that was kind of what I, as I was reading. <laughs> so let me start with, you know, Clyde Woods, the late, Clyde Wood's ancestor. His book, Development Arrested, I think is one of the finest critiques of white supremacy's extraction of black culture as black labor. Um, it, it is brilliant in that regard. Um, and, and I think you are definitely on to the fact that part of what motivated this project, right, is in fact this sense of loss what gets lost in the archive, what can't be recovered, you know, what is that song that you hear that you never get the name to, <laughs> you know, it, this is before you can Shazam it, <laughs> right, and, and figure out what it is you're hearing in Starbucks um, in their very curated, you know, version of soul music or Black History Month as it is now that they're presenting. It's also this notion of, of loss that's found in the archive, you know, chapter three, which really begins as kind of a, a commentary on hashtags in contemporary, you know, black social media that I then trace back to other musical moments that function the same way. You know, Max Roche's, you know, memorial for Martin Luther King, which actually comes two years after King's death um, in this very strange and unique gospel album that he does with the J.C. Watts singers, um, Nina Simone singing the King of Why the King of Love is Dead, Coltrane in Alabama. Um, the, and again, this is the kind of thing that I would have not have known because of digital music, but the idea that Sam Cooke recorded a tribute album to Billie Holiday. Right, something I didn't even know existed in the catalog and you know, and it's, it's not a great album, right? Because can't Sam Cooke can't really pull off yeah. that thing that is that, that is Billy Holiday, but it was important for him to do that, just as as important it was for Motown and the Supremes to pay tribute to Sam Cooke when he died in, in a full fledged you know album, and you know, and why the choice from an archival standpoint, why the choice of the Supremes recording a Sam Cooke tribute album as a as opposed to Marvin Gaye who everyone would have thought of as an heir apparent, right? 
so yeah, the, there is this loss in learning, you know, and, and loss that's in, in the archive, this version of Marvin Gaye that we hear and what becomes vulnerable um, is kind of lost to history, right? This kind of interiority that he's searching for that ironically gets picked up, you know, in 2011 by someone like Drake who records a song called Marvin's Room and folks are like, what the hell is that about? Well, in, in, in fact, it's intentional. He recorded the song in Marvin's Room, the studio, which was once Marvin Gaye's studio, right? Where he did all this groundbreaking work of interiority with his voice in the, in the mid to late 1970s. And then, you know, for me, I, I won't say that the last chapter is my favorite chapter. Um, the Marvin Gaye and, and Aretha Franklin chapter probably is, you know, simply because I love that music so much. But, you know, the fifth chapter, which spends so much time and is kind of grounded in the work of John Acomfra and the last angel in history, right? And, and when you see that film from the early 1990s, you know, first, it's, it's hard not to watch it and see Iron Man Tate on the screen and, and just have to double down on the fact that, that he's no longer, longer with us. Um, though, as is the case in all my work, he's, he's an echo that's always there, right? Because he introduces me to this, to this framework. But so much of that film, The Last Angel in History, or a conference film on um, Buddy Bolden, you know, which, which comes out fairly recently, right, is about these loss of things that we can no longer hold to, right? To talk about a Black archive is always already to talk about what is lost and what's missing, right? And the only way we can connect to it, you know, to your point, you know, Israel, are these emotions and feelings of melancholy about what's lost, even as we're listening to it? You know, I mentioned they reminisce over you, and I'm doing a presentation at the College Art Association, next week that should have been in, in the book. But there was an episode of the, of the, of the Boondocks um, first season called Riley Was Here, where Riley is doing all this kind of graffiti art. Um, and folks don't believe he's the artist. So finally, he paints his grandfather's house with a portrait of his dead parents. And as he's driving off with, uh, you know, the Boondocks version of Bob Ross, who's been teaching them um, painting techniques, you hear Tom, this Tom Scott song, right? Which of course was initially Tom Scott's called, called Today, which is a cover of Jefferson Airship's song Today. And as soon as you hear the horn lines, you realize, oh, that was the sample to they reminisce over you, <laughs> right? Pete Rock and CL Smooth, right? Which is a song about loss. And it's like the fact that this melancholy and mourning can go through multiple iterations of the archive. And what I loved about what um, the Boondocks did, what Aaron Magruder did with that episode, you know, for folks who were watching that episode and made the connection, you know, it's a feeling of melancholy that's experienced probably by 27 people, yeah. right? Because if you don't know the source material for They Reminisce Over You, if you know, don't know the backstory of large professors saying, I can't figure out what to do with this, <laughs> doesn't make any sense to me, and handing it off to Pete Rock, right, who finds a way to integrate this into this larger story of loss. And really one of the first, you know, in the death of Trouble T. Roy, one of the early losses in hip hop that kind of resonated throughout the community. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it speaks to everything that you just laid on the table, is it? It's really interesting to hear you bring up John and Comfra. I was excited to read about him in that fifth chapter. And, and to me, I was going to ask you a question about method, but you certainly answered it there. But to me, you know, he is your method in, in, in so far. You know, I noticed that, you know, for the event today, you circulated your Left of Black interview with him. And there's so many parallels, I think, between the work that's happening in The Last Angel of History and then certainly the work that's coming out through this book. Yeah, you know, it's funny, I, I first met John not knowing anything about his work. I, I knew something about The Last Angel in History, but you know, the difficulty of a filmmaker like John Acomfer is that the, the work is not readily available, right? You're, you're not gonna find this stuff up on YouTube. But he had come down to Austin 
because he was shooting a BBC documentary on, on R&B music. <laughs> um, and, and he brought my voice in. Um, I, I want to say Daphne was in that. There was a whole bunch of interesting folks that are in that. And then he came to Duke in 2011. Um, and this is when we had just started. It was the second season of Left to Black. Um, and so beginning to talk to him and connect with him in different ways. And then when he returned to Duke in 18 with the Buddy Bolden project, um, I have been really interested always in this kind of cutting edge music video, black video work. Um, and there are a lot of folks that, you know, folks talk about, you know, cutting edge now. I, I think about uh, the original version of Lemonade, and I can't remember the filmmaker's um, name at the moment, but that original, say that. Khalil Joseph? Right. Think about the work of Khalil Joseph, right, which in some ways would have been the obvious place to go, you know, though I talk a little bit about him in the film. Um, but co a conference work really predates that for me. And I wanted to talk about these kind of things that were in the archive. And when you go back to the early history of the Black Audio Collective, these filmmakers who can't afford film, right? Because this is before digital. And, and as you know, my friends at Liquid Blackness explain in, in the work that they've done around a conference work in the last angel in history, you know, the Black Audio Collective would go to libraries and bookstores and borrow books and take photos archival photos of pictures that were in books. And then they would splice them together and then play music on top of it, right? And, and those were their first films, right? And, and the genius of trying to find a way to archive Black life based on whatever resources you had at hand. And then the work that he does in The Last Angel of History, this idea of the data thief, which, which predates the way that we talk about sampling technology, right? The stealing of samples, right? Which is not really the stealing, it's the returning of samples to its source material, right? And, and thieving it from corporations, right? Who extracted it from the first place, you know, from, from black artists. Um, and, and the idea that this predates what we do with our phones, the kind of siphoning of culture and raising this question about the crisis of as expansive as the Black archive is, musical and otherwise, we have culturally, politically, and socially never had the capacity to truly, A, um, warehouse our, our own archives, physically or otherwise, right? We don't have the physical space for that, <laughs> and, and we don't have the digital space for that, and then we don't have the resources to curate it, right? So we have to, you know, build relationships strategically with other institutions, right? It's why Skip Gates, you know, begins to work with these corporations to do, you know, the Africana Encyclopedia 20 years ago, right? And, and that's an ongoing reality for us. And so much of this book was motivated, motivated for me with the average young person who could go into YouTube and extract <laughs> Blackness without any kind of contextual context, right? If that's a, a phrase. And without any of the DNA, the cultural DNA that helped produce it in the first place. And, and so the book for me was really kind of a reminder and a warning about what's getting lost in this moment. I, I um, this, is, this will be my last question to Sasha. If you have another one after this, um, certainly you can ask. Um, <clears throat> um, so I'm interested in uh, you just referencing notions of the crisis. <clears throat> And in particular, um, as I was reading the introduction to the book and you talk about, I was going back and forth between crisis and the challenge. Um, it seemed to me for some reason, you know, and maybe this is just also how my mind works. Um, when, he, when you kept reiterating the crisis, it seemed to me to archivally, I guess, um, bring to mind Hero Cruz's The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. <laughs> And then, of course, you know, Spillers, Horses Spillers then writes a kind of post-date, you know. Post-date. <laughs> um, and so, you know, Spillers does this really interesting mo move in the piece where she says that basically, you know, one of the crises is that, um, you know, in some ways our work has lost its, its kind of musicality. There's mm -hmm. something about mm -hmm. musical or even an approach to what we understand Black music to be that gets lost in a lot of our theoretical and, and scholarly work. And so to me, what I want to know is in your mind, do you think that the crisis of the archive is actually in some ways similar to the crisis of the Negro intellectual? 
Ooh, what a great question, Israel. You know, so yeah, every other week, and, and Ramsey is on uh, on this Zoom. Every other week, Ramsey will either give me a call and and I'll or I'll give him a call, and we'll, we'll com commiserate about what it is to be old men, old people, <laughs> in, in, in this game at the moment. Um, and I I think part of what you read in that Israel is correct. Um, the idea of the cultural critic is wasting away, right? Because it's no longer a need for those kinds of thinkers and writers in the culture. Um, it, you know, there was a piece, um, Abdu Ali, who's a great writer uh, and, and I love his work, you know, but he did that piece, you know, last year about, you know, who's going to be the next Greg Tate. The conditions that produce Greg Tate were so historically unique, right? You know, being able to have access like at a place like the, the Village Voice, which was free, <laughs> right? And having the freedom to do all kinds of things with his writing and make those kind of connections and how he built who he was from something that was really small, that in many ways, the best of Greg Tate disappears with the internet because the village voice doesn't make, really make that kind of, of transition. So the idea of this cultural critic figure, you know, is, is wasting away. You know, I, I go back to my early days and again, shout out to Pop Matters because, you know, that's where I cut my teeth writing about music, you know, for, for public audience. You know, I would get a CD and I would spend weeks, you know, because they would send you the CDs before they would come out. I'd spend two or three weeks with a CD and if it was an artist that was known, I'd listen to previous albums to hear where the connections are. And, and it was an act of art, right? I've always felt the cultural criticism as an art form best showed respect for the art in the first place by being an art form in and of itself, right? That's what I learned from Amiri Baraka, right? Early, right, you know, reading his public work, you know, in terms of music criticism. Um, you know, that's what I learned from Daphne Brooks, right? Reading her public work, right? Writing about various artists. And now we're at the point where an album drops at 12.01 and there's 75 think pieces <laughs> that are published five minutes later that, you know, where folks like literally just scan the songs <laughs> and, and throw some words on top of it totally disconnected from any context of who the artist was. And for me, this is not just about, you know, prioritizing the importance of the cultural critic, but the cultural critic is contributing to the culture, right? The culture cannot be sustainable if you don't have critics who can write about it in thoughtful, loving, and yet still critical ways, right? So for me, much the same ways that Harold Cruz is concerned about this crisis of black intellectuals, in the 1967, in 1967, when he published *The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual*, you know, for me, this book is is a, a small signal, right, an early signal of what I see as a crisis around cultural criticism, as it relates to music, but also other forms of Black cultural criticism. And as we've talked about too, you know, I think, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why, even as in Sasha and I have talked about this too, you know, even as we think about our own work. You know, there's a way in which, you know, I couldn't write about Kendrick Lamar until seven years later. <laughs> like I couldn't write about it in the moment because first of all, there was so much noise that you can't really kind of think, right, um, on your own. But also that, you know, like the think the thoughts are sometimes so fleeting that, you know, by the time you get to Mr. Morale, you're like, oh yeah, you what you thought about that album is not what was it's like, you know, one of my favorite, one of the reviews that I did at Pop Matters that I loved the most was a review of the Lau's first album, Firstborn, Second. Um, and, and the review itself posted the day of 9-11. So it kind of sticks in my head, you know, for that reason also. And, you know, we don't get another album from him, we think, you know, to a few years later. And then folks are going, wow, it's so different. But then when you finally get a copy of Love for Sale, exactly. right, the album that, you know, the label squashed because they didn't think it was commercial, then suddenly the moves from that first album to the third album make absolute sense. 
Now, there's a way in which there are a lot of critics who wouldn't think twice about that. <laughs> but, but for those of us who are interested in the archive in certain kinds of ways, it's important to make these kind of cultural connections. You know, John Coltrane isn't recording in a vacuum, right? Marvin Gaye's recording with Sam Cooke and Nat King Cole in the world, right? And his imagination of him being Frank Sinatra, right? And, and that all impacts the work. It's not happening in the vacuum. And the work's not happening now in the vacuum. We just don't have enough people, I think, who are working or visible, right? That, that's the other part of it, right? Because it's not like folks are really paying people to do music criticism. Music criticism now is entertainment reporting. Um, so yeah. In response to Israel's question a moment ago, you just said that criticism, criticism should be thoughtful, loving, and still critical. But oftentimes in the book as well, another word you use in relation to cultural criticism is mystification. And I suppose maybe that's a good place for us. To end. you know, as you as you think about what cultural criticism has become, you know, lasting words and sort of what should it be and where does mystification play into that? Because that's such an intriguing term. I, I will explain that or, or, or in thinking about hip hop in the 1980s and specifically thinking about Eric B and Rakim, Poor Righteous Teachers, Brand Nubian, this moment in hip hop where hip hop is still political, but it's coded. Most folks, even black folks, have no idea what the 5% nation is. <laughs> when Rakim's dropping those references, when Big Daddy Kane is dropping those references and Kane should have been part of that tribute last night, but that's my East Coast bias, right? It's a way in which it's circulated publicly, right? This idea of hidden in plain sight. So everybody can hear what's going on, but everybody can't hear what's going on. And that also went in terms of vocal style and performance, right? And we get to this point when in, in the 1990s where there's a clarity in everything that's being said. No one had to try to figure out what P Diddy or Diddy or Diddy Diddy or you know whatever the hell he's called Puppy Diddy Daddy, whatever we're calling him today. You know, you didn't have to decipher both in terms of the style of his lyricism and what he was actually saying, right? And there's a way in which the price for hip hop's commercialization was for everybody to be in in the story. I come fundamentally from a place that black music and black culture amongst many things is foremost a liberatory project. And a liberatory project can't exist wholly in the commercial world, right? Because then it, it loses what gives it an edge. Everybody wasn't in supposed to listen to John Coltrane, right? Everybody wasn't supposed to listen to Sly and the Family Stone. Right? Everybody wasn't supposed to listen to Prince, right? If we read into this a certain kind of liberatory sensibility. And so when I talk about you know mystification in the archive, right, it is really about critics and scholars complicating folks' access to the music. Right. There's some stuff going on here, but this is stuff that you don't really get. And, and which is why I was really drawn to this idea of of maroon right maroon culture the idea of black archives as maroon as something that is hidden in plain sight who systematically has to move on right so that there's no clear evidence of its presence right what you know amir baraka brilliantly said in in my last word you know is this idea of the changing same thank you so much thank you all right, so this seems like a good place to start the Q&A. Uh, we do have a few questions here. And of course, there's time if, if, if somebody thinks of another question to go ahead and put in the chat. All right, so Sonnet Retman, do you want to unmute and ask the first question? Uh, yeah, thank you. That was so beautiful. What's Mark up, Sonnet? Hi, I can't wait to get this book. So many things. So I, this is... Um, a ways back in the conversation, I think this was a question, maybe Israel, that you were asking Mark about um, about locating oneself in the archive. And I just was thinking about Sherry Tucker's idea of archival desire, 
and this was with her um, swing time book, but mm -hmm. the idea of actually the moments in the archive when your desire is thwarted, where you have to realize you're looking for something that then doesn't materialize, materialize. in the ways that you <laughs> wanted it to materialize or thought it would and then the ways that makes you listen or look in the archive or understand the archive differently so i just wanted to hear your riff on that yeah you know that that tom scott sample that i talk about with they reminisce over you it took me 15 years to find that sample <laughs> um I, and the last person i would have thought was tom scott i i must have gone through virtually every eddie harris album from 1967 to 1977, because Eddie Harris was one of these saxophonists who, you know, this, this electrified thing, right? And that's what I thought I was hearing in the sample. And, and I can remember those times going through all these damn Eddie Harris albums, it's like, damn, that's not the sample. <laughs> so I, I get the very point that you're making that, that sometimes you go into the archive and you don't find the thing that you want and you have to be patient with it. Right. It, you know, at some point, you know, like likes a maroon, you know, the, the archive will reveal itself, you know, in a moment. You just have to be ready to, you know, to hear it. Fantastic. OK, um, Christine Capitola, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, hi, thank you so much. For this conversation, I've been revisiting Anne Savekovich as an archive of feelings lately since it's the 20th anniversary and we're working on something around that. So I had a question about maybe putting that idea of queer archives in conversation with your idea of Black archives and ephemera um, with the quick summary that in that text, queer archives really focuses on art, especially like performance-based art that otherwise doesn't have any documentation. So the archive and the ephemera kind of become the only way that we have anything about it. And I was really struck by the artists you were listing, especially in the beginning of the talk, just how much visibility and just audible presence they have in the American popular music canon. So how do you sift through or maybe hold together that visibility they have and our all visibility they have too with holding the intangibilities of it together. I'm thinking of something just from yesterday of just Beyonce in one of the acceptance speeches saying this music was made possible, right, by Black yeah. queer people. So giving us a, an example of black, black and Queer Archive together. But yeah, back to Black Archive and Ephemera, how do you sit with and hold together the visibility those artists had in some sense in this recorded music, um, maybe cultivated image sense with going for the intangible things that's held in the music and what's around it as well. Yeah, you know, the one of the chapters that we didn't talk about, well, Israel mentioned it briefly, is the second chapter. Um, and the second chapter is a riff off a experimental novel by Ricardo Cortez Cruz um, called uh, Eight Days of Bleeding, Five Days of Bleeding. I can never remember how many days it is. And there's a primary character in the novel called Zuzu. And the book is an, a practice in hypertext before hypertext existed. The book was published in 1992. And Zuzu speaks almost exclusively throughout the novel in song lyrics by Black women blues singers from the early 20th century. And, and her lyrics almost, her words almost have no meaning without knowing what the source material is. And for me, you know, it, it was a detective story on the one hand, it's, it's another book that I always wanted to write about and, and it's been difficult for me to teach because I couldn't figure it out. And it wasn't until I understood it as a, as a practice in hypertext that, that I understand, right? It, it's really like his version of, of James Joyce's Ulysses. And being able to now access the internet to track down some of the samples. And for me, it was an opportunity to just show in the archive, these are folks who've been disappeared, right? What, who now exist? Um, you know, one of those artists, you know, came to the world ironically because of Bonnie Raitt, you know, Sippy Wallace, right? Who had done a version of one of her songs um in 1969 and came forward to the point where 
you know, she was touring as a young musician with Sippy Wallace and introducing Sippy Wallace to a whole nother generation. Because when we think about black women blues singers, right, it's the obvious folks, right? But not all these other kind of women who are working in the archive, you know, someone like Victoria Spivey and illuminating to me, you know, first of all, just knowing who she is, but how she was a black woman who had her own label in the 1960s and eventually recorded someone like Sippy Wallace on her label. Um, but who's most well known for a song called Black, Sn Black Snake Moan, which was actually jacked by another uh, Black blues singer, Black male blues singer. And even in this context, she gets disappeared in the archive. Writing about in that same chapter, I, I jokingly called them the right singers, but they weren't uh, the white, the right sisters, but they're not sisters, Yvonne Wright and Sarita Wright. Um, these two Black women songwriters who Stevie Wonder collaborates with and turned up his songwriting, you know, from 1970 up until Inner Visions. And we all talk about the genius of who, Mar of who Steve Stevie Wonder is, but he is basically apprenticing, particularly with Sarita Wright, right, and bringing up his songwriting skills. <laughs> Right, so that when we get to inner visions, we get pure Stevie, but, but we don't get to that without the work that she does with him, both doing their marriage and afterwards, right, on Talking Book and, uh, you know, Music of My Mind and, and from where I'm, where I'm coming from and all those kinds of things, right? And so for me, it's always important to find these kind of folks in the archive that, that are invisible to us, even in their hypervisibility. And I always thought about Beyonce as being, you know, really in an interesting figure here because she pulls so much of the archive into her work and to her credit, as popular and visible as she is, she's always been clear to talk of, to folks about where those influences have come, right? So whether or not it's dancers in Memphis or most recently talking about, you know, both queer and black and queer performers in terms of dance music, you know, she represents, she understands the importance of connecting the dots in that regard, right? Even if her audience is unprepared for that and uninterested in that. Great, okay. Um, Stichi Talkin, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah. Um, I was interested, um, as you're talking about hip hop uh, existing as a sonic archive, um, how we kind of think through uh, in kind of the more modern moment where hip hop producers uh, are capturing from stuff from YouTube and maybe not necessarily having the context, you know, they're not pulling vinyl from their parents' collection. They're not necessarily digging in the same way and having like, liner note to be like, oh, what did I find? Like, I don't know if you have thoughts about how we position that. Yeah, I, I think uncontextualized samples are, are always a problem, right? For a bunch of reasons. Um, in the earliest days, you know, the biggest criticism is that the artists weren't getting financially recognized for the use of those samples, right? Even though in most cases, it was impossible for them to be financially recognized because they didn't own the publishing rights. <laughs> so the songs that were being sampled, right? That those were going to, you know, actual publishing companies and record companies in that regard. I think that's where there is a job and a responsibility of working critics to be able to create the context in which the sampling is taking place. Uh, again, that has been most often my entry point into hip hop over the last 35 years, at least to the extent that it's been, you know, a sampled based music. Um, before I even process the lyrics and all those kinds of things, I'm, I'm chasing down the sample and not because I envisioned myself as a hip hop producer and I'm trying to collect samples, you know, to be able to produce stuff. We used to laugh all the time in the class with Knife Wonder because they always, you know, out of 125 students, there always be 25 students that would show up with their hard drives, you know, trying to get access, you know, to these the source material that the Knife Wonder and you know used for, for samples. But for me, it was always to make sure there's a kind of continuum and understanding the product, the production of black music across generations, right? You know, 
my moment where I got really deep into jazz occurred because of Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth, because of Ali Shaheed Muhammad, because of um, DJ Premier and their real interest in this kind of 60s and 70s soul jazz, right? Because it created a generational context for me to connect with the music that I normally wouldn't have had access to. Okay. Uh, Daniel McNeil has a question. Do you want to unmute and ask? Oh, thank you. Um, thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciated the reflections around cultural criticism as an art form. And I was also struck by the reflections around John Comfort, and it reminded me of Stuart Hall's work in constituting an archive, particularly his interest in reflections around a potential distinction between, on the one hand, the critic, the practitioner, the artist, and the historian that Hall associates with driving through a particular line of interpretation, which animates their work. And on the other hand, an archivist who requires a certain withdrawal of investment, a certain disinterestedness, a certain respect for the work itself, for the practices of artists who have worked in contexts and paradigms different from one's own. And I always go back to that article as well to think about the work of an archivist requiring attention, even humility, for the real discontinuities and contingency of history. And I was wondering if you might be open to saying a little bit more about how you approach Black Ephemera, for example, did you approach it as a critic, as a historian and or an archivist, or did the writing process help you clarify um, whether one of those particular roles spoke more clearly to you and what was the role of attention and humility uh, in your right, listening and writing habits or practices yeah that's a great question Daniel and, and y'all need to get Daniel's new book by the way um, which is incredible talking about Paul Gilroy um, and, and one of my favorite critics um, from New York City in the 80s and the 90s. Um, but, you know, to your question, Daniel, I think, and, and I would say this about all of my work, I function as all of the above in different kinds of moments, right? I'm, I'm someone who's never been tied to methodology in any real sense. The methodology has been very different in all of my books and different in the context of, of each one of those books. So, you know, when I'm writing about stacks, I think I'm writing more as, as a historian. Um, when I'm writing about, you know, Ricardo Cortez Cruz's work and, and this work with black women, blues singers, I, I think I'm functioning more as, in that case, you know, the, the archivist. Uh, I'm very much in chapter three and chapter four, um, I'm writing more so as a critic. Um, and, and I think the last chapter is kind of all of the above, um, though I would add that that's probably the chapter where I'm also most attempting to function as, as a theorist in that context also, some sort of theory behind you know, the function of the archive. And I think you're right, for me, the writing process, you know, I didn't know any of this before I did any of these chapters, right? It, it was pretty much revealed to me as I was doing the writing, I've often joked about all my books. Um, they revealed themselves to me in the process. Um, and, and the older I get, quote unquote, the more established I get, whatever that means, the, the, the time that I think I should have most control over the skill set is actually been the time in my career where the books take a longer time to reveal themselves to me. And you know, if I thought I had some sort of control over the earlier books, this was the one book in which I had no control. The book told me what it was going to be, you know, as opposed to what it was. I, I've joked about the two previous books, New Black Man and Looking for Leroy, that, that at some point they were the same book. Um, and, and they told me, <laughs> we're not the same book, we're two really different projects. I'm gonna let Little Brother, New Black Man go first. 
right? And, and then I'll be patient, you know, when, when looking for Leroy comes out. Um, but even then I had some sense of control in that context. Um, I think the gift, the wisdom, if you will, that's come with doing this for so long is actually giving up the reins, right? And, and just kind of allowing the writing and the ideas and, and the texts themselves that I'm trying to extra extrapolate from to dictate to me, you know, what these projects are. Natalie Bullock Brown has a question. You will yeah, not... And I'm gonna take one more because I gotta catch a flight. <laughs> so... Okay, this, is, this will be the last one then. Hey, Mark. Hey. What's up, homie? What's up, homie? Hey, it's so good to see y'all. And Sasha is wonderful to meet you virtually as well. I'm gonna try and make this really quick. Um, but you, you, you mentioned, Mark, that, you know, you kind of went down a rabbit hole trying to find this particular sample. You thought it was Eddie Harris, ended up being somebody else. And it made me think about quite a few samples that I um, uh, dis discovered uh, during the pandemic that were all this sort of 60s soul jazz that you're talking about, um, which seems to be a staple of early hip hop. And so my question is, it's, it's probably a couple of questions. Is there something about how hip hop has historically mined the archive that plays into the theme of maroons and black liberation? And is it that we perhaps don't as a people recognize the full potential of hip hop as a liberatory force because that fact has been obscured perhaps by design, by the way that music journalism has talked about it and, and sort of diverted our gaze and understanding in directions that perhaps have nothing to do with the intent. Yeah, yeah I would say, Natalie, that it's not just hip hop. Um, that's been African-American cultural practices before hip hop. Um, when you're thinking about the bebop artists in the 40s that would sample Tin Pan Alley songs and melodies, Right, and just kind of throw them in the middle and then and, and improvise on top of them. The intense borrowing that took place amongst black blues musicians, singing each other's songs, borrowing from each other's songs, but creating different kinds of inflections and other kinds of gestures to make it different. And I think, you know, for hip hop artists, particularly in the early days of sampling, you know, once there became a context in which hip hop producers and artists could be financially punished for not getting permission to use samples, or even if they could pay for them, right, are denied use of it, right, you know, because, you know, whoever was concerned about, you know, how the music was going to be used, et cetera, et cetera. It went back to, I think, to a very old practice of Black artists of obscuring source material, you know, whether it's, you know, these R&B singers, um, in the 1950s, who would sing these lyrics that were hypersexual, but sing them in a way where folks didn't necessarily pick up on them. I always talk about that that Bull Moose Jackson song, 10 Inch Record, right? Where, where he's talking about 10 inches or something, right? And, and when people think that they know what the 10 inch is, he pauses and then goes record, right? Talking about a 10 inch record, right? You know, the folks would have been playing. I think hip hop artists, producers out of necessity figured out whether it was, you know, slurring samples or chop and screwed, all efforts to kind of obscure this source material that in many ways was our source material, right? But were owned by other forces, right? So having to steal back her a confer, you know, these notions of black culture leaving it as a conference would say in terms of the data thief. I mean, those hip hop producers in the early 90s were the best example. And I think really were the inspiration for a conference thinking about this of, of stealing back data, black data, right? From these corporations and other more powerful entities. Okay, well, on that note, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much to Mark, Sasha and Israel. Uh, please join us next week when Lynn Melnick will be here to talk about her memoir, I've Had to Think of a Way to Survive on Trauma, Distance, and Dolly Parton, published by the University of Texas Press. She will be in conversation with Deborah Perez, who
whose work American Diva is in progress. And we hope to see you all next week.